Oh, John Kerry's Mideast peace talks have gone nowhere. Hey, all Scott Horton here for the Council for the National Interest at councilforthenationalinterest.org. U.S. military and financial support for Israel's permanent occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is immoral, and it threatens national security by helping generate terrorist attacks against our country. And face it, it's bad for Israel, too. Without our unlimited support, they would have much more incentive to reach a lasting peace with their neighbors. It's past time for us to make our government stop making matters worse. Help support CNI at councilforthenationalinterest.org. All right, you guys, welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, Scott Horton Show. And next up is Roy Gutman from McClatchy Newspapers reporting from Turkey. Hey, Roy, how are you doing? Uh, okay, fine, Scott. How are you? I'm doing real good. Appreciate you joining us back on the show here. And uh, lots of news to cover with you here. Uh, first of all, tell us about this airstrike in, uh, in Syria. Uh, you say here that at least 50 Syrian civilians were killed. Is that correct? Uh, That's my understanding, yes. I mean, I wasn't there, uh, but uh, that's what witnesses in the town are saying. Uh, The town is called Al-Bab. It's not far from the Turkish border, uh, north of uh, Aleppo. And um, there was an airstrike there on the 28th of December, um, it, uh, it was never announced by the uh, Central Command or by the Joint Task Force, <clears throat> but uh, local people um, uh, reported it out uh, to um, a, a young fellow we have as a stringer inside of Syria. And, um, they, and, and then I went to the Central Command and I asked them about it. I said, you know, people are saying that there was an airstrike, that, the, that a, a major building in the town was leveled, and that there were a lot of people inside who... Uh, there, there were uh, members of the uh, Islamic State, you know, the extreme radical group, who were there as guards, but they had turned this building into a jail, and they were holding civilians. And there were, um, according to local people, <clears throat> at least 50 civilians uh, were uh, were killed. And uh, most of just people being held in the jail there, huh? On, on, do you, uh... Well... You know, they, they, uh, the Islamic State has its own idea of justice. Uh, they, their version of Sharia or, or Islamic uh, religious law is an extreme one. Um, and so uh, you can be arrested for wearing jeans, uh, for smoking. You can be arrested for uh, arriving at the mosque too late for the afternoon prayers. Uh, you can be, and, 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 you're gonna, and, and you can be arrested for insulting them in public or for talking back to them in public. And you can be held uh, indefinitely uh, by them in their jail, and this is one of the jails that they set up. Um, other people uh, were held, uh, and I, I think most of those people ordinarily would be released after a period of time. But then there's a second group who are uh, fighters uh, from the rebel forces that, you know, are the, the moderate rebel forces who have been getting American backing, uh, or from other uh, groups fighting the regime. And those people are held, <clears throat> and very often they're executed in the public square. Uh, so it's a really uh, terrible regime, uh, as everybody knows. Uh, one of the maybe the, the uh, most dangerous and and uh, nasty regime on earth. Yeah. Well, and hell, even if it's a uh, a building full of real felons, that doesn't mean it's okay to bomb it and have America serving as ISIS's executioners over people arrested, you know, especially over nothing like you're describing. But uh, even even well, if it was some murderers, it still doesn't make it right to bomb them like that. I, I mean, I, I have to assume uh, that, uh, the, first of all, the uh, Central Command has not conceded that they did kill civilians. They do not acknowledge it, uh, They are, but they are investigating it, um, uh, certainly after I contacted them. <clears throat> and uh, we'll have to see what they come up with. Mm. I don't think there was anything intentional about it. I mean, they, they were hitting a building that w- had been commandeered by the Islamic State. Mm. And and was, yeah, they just probably had incomplete. They just probably had incomplete yeah. intelligence about what was going on there, right? Uh, absolutely. That's what mm. that's and, that, and that's the rub because mm. one of the reasons they have incomplete intelligence uh, throughout northern Syria is that they're refusing to talk t- to their own allies about where the Islamic State uh, is, uh, is located, you know, where they have the buildings. They, <clears throat> this has been going on now since September, that the U.S. has been bombing, but it has been bombing without any consultation 
with um, their allied forces on the ground. And so it's likely that they, they will make mistakes in that situation, in that circumstance. Um, it, it's almost made, you know, it's, it's meant to happen. And I think it's a disastrous thing when it does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Now, the fact that they didn't announce it, uh, is that interesting to you? Because they typically do say we dropped this many bombs on Mosul today and this many dr- bombs on uh, Raqqa, right? Uh, well, it's very troubling. Uh, and um, I don't know how to explain it. And I, uh, <laughs> that's all I can say about it, because um, I, I had to go back to them maybe four or five times and ask them, uh, would you please check and double check and triple check because I, we're very, con- I'm very confident of the information I've got. And uh, finally, they came back to me about four or five days later, and they said, you know, full of apologies, and they said, we're really sorry we we uh, didn't get this answer sooner, and we're, and we're we're very sorry that we didn't announce this at the time it happened. They said it was an administrative error, and uh, I guess one has to accept that on face value um, until proven otherwise. Now. The problem is, Scott, that I think there are other cases of um, bombings <clears throat> which have not been announced. And, you know, the only way I can do, I can check them out as, uh, as a reporter is one by one. Um, so I've sent them a request on a second bombing <clears throat> that is said to have occurred the same day as uh, this one, which is the 28th of December. Um, and I said, you know, the local... Um, Civic activists, even though this is under the control of the Islamic State and there's zero freedom in that circumstance, still uh, local civic activists have reported that there was a, a, a bombing in the second town. And um, I said, could you please check this one out? Now, um, I don't have quite all the evidence in the second town that I did in the town of El Bob. I don't have a photograph, for example. <clears throat> I don't have a death toll. I don't have anything like that. Uh, the, the building they, they hit there was a headquarters of the Islamic State, um, and it, supposedly it was not a jail. It was, it was just a headquarters. So I don't think you have the civilian uh, death toll there. But nevertheless, it's the second, it's the second case of uh, a bombing that was not announced. And um, anyway, so I, I got in touch with him on this. I think it was Sunday, and here it is Tuesday. I haven't heard back, <clears throat> but I assume that they are going through the checking process. And uh, if, if, if it's true, I'll uh, have to write another story. But quite frankly, there are other cases beyond that because, um, you know, we monitor the, uh, the Syrian um, uh, various um, uh, social media very closely, and we've heard about other cases. So, I, I you know, this, this is a story still in progress. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, uh, they told uh, Central Command, I think it was, or the, somebody at the Pentagon told Vice Magazine just two weeks ago, uh, maybe, yeah, a week, week and a half ago, Roy, that, oh, you know, we don't know of any civilian casualties that we've caused this whole time. We're doing such a great job at this. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, um, I think that, that uh, whoever said that um, really uh, went way beyond their level of knowledge <clears throat> because um, I think, I believe it was the uh, spokesman for the Pentagon uh, uh, Admiral Kirby, or Admiral Kirby, uh, last week, who said uh, just about a week ago today that um, they've had reports of civilian casualties. They're investigating them. They they, they they truly want to avoid them, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Now, uh, you know what? The not he didn't give any numbers. He didn't say how many cases are being investigated. But uh, I know myself from uh, last September when the very first bombings occurred in. Uh, Syria uh, by the U.S. Um, at the time, that um, a number of civilians were killed in the in Idlib province. I think it's about 10 or 12 uh, on that order, uh, on that very day, and I reported it that day. Uh, I don't recall anybody ever disputing uh, the report. Um, maybe they didn't notice it, but, <laughs> but it was a very carefully written report. Um, and so that's at least a dozen. And I've heard uh, from a Syrian human rights group who monitor uh, the war very closely uh, that the total number uh, that they estimate, that, they, that they've collected from all over Syria since September 23rd is 40. 
All right, now. And I believe, uh, and this, this is a group that is very conscientious and really, you know, they get names. They don't just, uh, they don't just, right, uh, right. Uh, numbers. All right, I'm sorry. I got to stop you here so we can take this break, but we'll be right back, everybody. It's Roy Gutman from McClatchy Newspapers reporting from Turkey. Hey, all Scott Horton here. Are you a libertarian and or peacenik? Live in North America? If you want, you can hire me to come and give a speech to your group. I'm good on the terror war and intervention, civil liberty stuff, blaming Woodrow Wilson for everything bad in the world, Iran, central banking, political realignment, and, well, you know, everything. I can teach markets to liberals and peace to the right. Just watch me. Check out scotthorton.org slash speeches for some examples and email me, scott at scotthorton.org, for more information. See you there. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Talking with Roy Gutman from McClatchy Newspapers. Out of Turkey. And now, Roy, I want to go back a little while to, geez, maybe even a couple of months ago. I think uh, maybe two or three months ago. I was trying to get you on the show, and I think it never did work out. Um, and it was about, or maybe I just talked with Landay about it and so checked it off the list. Um, and it was a, your report about how the CIA was cutting off the Free Syrian Army in the north, or, or actually they were taking over control of their Free Syrian Army brigades directly in the north and the south of Syria and cutting out the entire bureaucratic establishment of the Free Syrian Army based in Turkey, who I guess, you know, they just sit in their hotels and smoke cigars or whatever all day. But then, so whatever happened with that? Well, what happened was, uh, first of all, <clears throat> it isn't quite the way you put it, but close. Um, the uh, CIA started up a program, a covert aid program, although it was <laughs> not a well-kept secret, uh, at the beginning of last year. And they, um, instead of going through the structure of um, uh, the opposition forces, uh, they call them sort of the coalition um, uh, um, government in exile or um, interim government, <clears throat> instead of going through them and their defense minister and the, the staff that they set up, the military staff, <clears throat> the CIA went uh, directly to commanders and started uh, and told them, you know, you come in with your proposal for what you're going to do in the next month, <clears throat> and we'll give you money. Um, and so they circumvented an entire c command structure. I wouldn't say it was the greatest command structure in the world, but it was a command structure. And you need that kind of thing in any kind of mil in any military. Um, and so they basically created um, a group of warlords as a process, and uh, and they made it impossible to coordinate any anything bigger, anything broader, anything. Um, uh, you know, strategic. So this last, and it was a disastrous time for them to do that very thing. But this is what the Obama administration decided to do. And the, the reason it was such a huge disaster was last year was the rise, sort of the rise of the Islamic State. They became, they, they really were very strong in northern Syria. But at the beginning of the year, <clears throat> the the um, opposition forces, the rebel forces, the pro-Western forces, um, uh, destroyed. Uh, the bases of the Islamic State and, and kicked, kicked them out of much of northern Syria. So you had a success, an incredible, unexpected, unfunded, but, but spontaneously op, uh, run um, operation, which led to something that was a very, very positive outcome for, from the Western and the American perspective. But because the American government was supporting these commanders um, individually, without any staff, without any strategy without any thinking, there was no way to build on that success. And instead, what happened was in, by, by creating a group of warlords, they, they uh, uh, basically uh, you know, di divided up the battlefield and, uh, and, 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 and you know, micromanaged it and manipulated it. So uh, later in the year, when the bombing began, the, um, uh, the U.S. started bombing the Islamic State in Syria, and the uh, al-Qaeda what do we call it, the, the Al-Qaeda extension in northern uh, Syria, namely uh, the Nusra Front, they call themselves, um, they, uh, they, they did it without consulting even the warlords that they were supporting, and they made big mistakes. They bombed places, they, they killed civilians, and they alienated uh, this group of, uh, of uh, commanders from the basic uh, support they had in the public. Um, they had some big setbacks in the month of November, uh, the, the radicals gained, uh, the moderates lost. Uh, the outcome was uh, a lot of territory switched hands that had been in moderate hands and then went into radical hands. 
Um, and at that point, instead of trying to build up the forces and, 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 and sort of learn the lessons of the year, uh, the U.S. decided to punish them, basically, and cut off um, support, <clears throat> certainly to all the groups that lost territory, but in addition, they suspended aid to some of the groups that didn't lose territory. Uh, it, was, it was a completely upside-down uh, uh, approach. I, I, for the life of me, I can't get anybody in the administration to explain it. They don't even answer the phone. They don't, they don't uh, answer any questions. But uh, that's what happened. So there was, a, there was a cutoff, a severe cutoff, in the month of December. Some of that aid has now been restored. Um, I don't know quite how much. Um, after I wrote my story and I was quoting individual commanders and I was quoting officials of the uh, coalition, um, uh, the U.S. government went to them, and it looks like they threatened them in some way that if they ever talked to a reporter again, certainly on the record, <clears throat> that everything would be cut off for all time. So it's very hard to report that story. But I do know that, they say, I, in general, there was a, a major cutoff in, in the north of Syria in uh, early December. Um, there was a restoration to some degree, uh, I gather, earlier this month. Mm. All right. Now, so which groups are we talking about here when we talk about uh, the so-called moderates is is moderation simply a function of being willing to meet with CIA officers, or how do you measure that? Um, you know, the battlefield is full of groups. Uh, the whole Syrian uh, revolution was spontaneous. It was you know ground up. It was not organized at the top. There's still no no real leader has emerged, and so. Uh, you have uh, at first, um, and then the, and then the Assad regime went after them uh, using its army. So this led to uh, the creation of armed uh, resistance um, throughout the country, mostly local, locally based. And at the, at the beginning, they were uh, they were supported, and they were they originated in the towns and the cities and the valleys and the and the villages that they came from. Um, so they were locally based. Well, but then uh, all the veterans of the last war in Iraq, of the Sunni-based insurgency, uh, the the Iraqi and the Syrian veterans, started waging holy jihad by, you know, early summer well, 2011, they, 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 right? They, Al-Nusra and then I mean, ISIS. They, they, they saw that there was a vacuum because while uh, the government could not run, um, uh, you know, about it was at least half of the country uh, that, that they had lost control of, uh, neither could these homegrown groups. And so uh, al-Qaeda uh, saw the opportunity uh, and sent people from uh, Iraq and then, and then collected more people, was able to raise money, uh, and other radical groups sprang out of all of this chaos. And so now, uh, when I say uh, moderate groups, what I'm saying is that these are the secular groups, the groups that are not preaching a religious uh, state, who want free elections, who want... Uh, democracy, or at least they say they do. I mean, we don't know until until they get a chance to get in power, if they ever do. Yeah. Um, well, but, but Roy, you know, we do, got... They do exist. There are plenty of stories, though, exist. about the FSA also beheading <clears throat> people, even if it's <clears throat> al-Nusra and ISIS prisoners they're beheading. There they are beheading them. Uh, and, you know, we got the Al-Farouk Brigade. They had called for elections. David Enders, had, your colleague, uh, former colleague, had told this story. Um, about how, yeah, they had called for elections, the al Farouk Brigade, but that was their commander that was uh, on film eating the guy's heart or liver or whatever it was. Um, and then he had the Northern Storm Brigade that John McCain met with, but then they had told Time Magazine, yeah, we're veterans of the Iraq War where we fought against the Americans. They're right there on video saying so. And so, uh, you know, Patrick Coburn says when he's in Turkey and he talks with representatives of all these groups, they're all pro 9-11. They're all pro-war with America, and they well, all are yeah, more or less are. al-Nusra guys, no matter how you slice it. I think uh, Patrick <clears throat> does some very interesting reporting, but he he really doesn't make uh, he doesn't discriminate very closely. I've uh, the, the commanders that I'm mentioning, I'm referring to specifically, are the ones who were vetted, who were approved, who were trained, and who were uh, equipped by the CIA. Uh, and they were, and they they made it through the hurdles because the CIA determined that they were none of those, uh, uh, you know, that you just mentioned that they were not, uh, that they were they were trustworthy and they had had not uh, joined any jihad. So there were at least a dozen or or, or fourteen or fifteen at most commanders who, who passed through all those hurdles. 
Um, those are the ones that I've been writing about. I see. Uh, they, uh, and, but there are others as well. But I, I, I have to disagree with uh, the, the gist of what you're saying because I, I think that there are many people that look Syrians. I, I, my experience, and I've met so many people in ID, you know, in in in, in uh, displaced persons camps <clears throat> as refugees uh, in Syria, out of Syria. I've met so many. Of, they are Syrians are not crazy. They are not. Uh, jihadist in, in in their aspirations. They are there. Are many, many, many. Probably the vast majority are normal people who want just simply a decent life. Well, you can say so, the same thing about the Iraqi Sunnis too. I mean, they're not from Saudi Arabia either, and yet they're ruled by Baghdadi now. <laughs> so, well, you know, it's politics. It, the politics leads to these things. <clears throat> it leads to radicals taking over. And the problem in Syria is that the U.S. Government recognized, almost all security agencies recognized more than two years ago, that if the U.S. supported moderates, not, not everybody who's going to be a perfect moderate, but that there were moderates to be supported, that that would be the, the biggest card that the U.S. could play. But the White House rejected it. Uh, I mean, you had the, the, the CIA, you had the uh, Department of Defense, and you had the uh, State Department all uh, urging Obama to take one course. And Obama went the other way. He decided to give them the minimal backing to bring the CIA into it. And, and as I say, the rest of it is the history of last year. And it's a history. It's a fast history. Although, but when you so say I, that, I, you kind of, you're neglecting to mention that that means Hillary Clinton and David Petraeus came up with this. So that's not the same as, oh, it was the consensus well, of they, the whole no, government not, or anything like that. I mean, take, take a counterexample, for example. We armed up the Shiite. Uh, army of Iraq, the the avowed enemies of the Islamic State in every way forever, and yet they turn around and ran and left all their weapons behind for the Islamic State to get. Um, after training them up and spending tens and tens of billions of dollars building that army over a decade, but here we we're supposed to train up some guys who were have the exact same goals as the Al Nusra Front, but just aren't the Al Nusra Front because. They've been vetted, and we're going to give these guys enough guns and enough bombs and enough money that they're going to be able to take on Assad and Nusra and the Islamic State, Roy? I mean, come on. Well, you know, you you have uh, constructed a uh, scenario there <clears throat> that, uh, that suggests uh, uh, Syria is bound, and we should do nothing about it, that it is bound to become a radical uh, jihadist state. Um, you know, I, I happen to think that, 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 that a jihadist, even a micro-state, like the Islamic uh, State now, and they call themselves the Caliphate, is an absolute disaster for uh, Western interests, for U.S. interests. Oh, no, I agree with that. I just think it's a problem more likely to, to resolve itself than have... Uh... Uh, America come in and build up this kind of army, which they were unable to do in Iraq, even though they were building it out of the Bad Brigade, which hates the Islamic State. You know what I mean? Are you understand what I'm saying here? Where you're talking about well, basically like doing an awakening type movement where you hire all friendly Sunni tribal <laughs> guys to take on the jihadists and Assad in the middle of a civil war with the secular Baathist coalition of everybody else in the country. Well, uh, you have to begin by defining the problem. <clears throat> the problem is it's a, a security vacuum. It's the case in both uh, uh, Iraq and in Syria. <clears throat> and the security problem, the security vacuum in Iraq came about in large part because the U.S. exited uh, Iraq at a time that was really before it, 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 should, have, it should have left there. And it's a whole different story about why that happened. But it happened, and there was a, there was a vacuum. And... <clears throat> the Maliki government, instead of trying to create or, or sustain an army that was multi-ethnic, uh, multi-national, uh, um, uh, went for a Shia-only uh, army and destroyed the army. But when the U.S. left, I don't think it was in that circum in that condition. It was our absence uh, that really allowed that to happen. And likewise, if you have a security vacuum in Syria that is the result of an uprising against a, um, a, a regime that everybody agrees is, is dictatorial and uh, cruel and, and, and really uh, willing to kill all of its own people, um, you know, that created a vacuum. Uh, so my point is define 
the problem and then to find the solution. And, uh, and I don't think you're going to get to that solution very quickly. Yeah. But the solution in both places is you have to have security. You have to have moderates uh, running it. And you've got, to, you've got to find some way to support that. And the one thing you should never do is walk away from it. And that's what the, what, what the U.S. government did in Iraq. And that's what it's doing now in Syria. Then again, they didn't, they didn't the have to invade and regime change the country in 2003. So let's not leave well, that out. If Uday and Kuday, if Uday and Kuse were here, then Baghdadi would be dead, right? Well, of course that was the original sin. But the, but the problem is, if you're the president of the United States, or if you have an administration that follows the one that did this invasion, you've got to accept the world as it is, and you've got to you've got to move on. You've got to work with with what you have. Well, but you and know, I you also the skipped the part where. The side that we fought for, that we won, and that we put in power, they were the ones who told us to leave. And George Bush had to sign. Bush was pushing for 56 permanent bases, and Maliki told him, no, no, no. And Bush signed on the dotted line in 2008 and said, okay, the guys that we helped win the the capital city and the democracy and everything else are telling us thanks a lot. Now beat it. So uh, what were we supposed so to do? I, Reinvade I, 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 and insist? I, I, uh, no, but I I was in Iraq uh, in 2011 when all the negotiations were going on about extending the American presence. Um, put it this way: uh, the absence of the American uh, forces uh, who were doing by the, by that point they really had learned their job terrifically and they were doing a very solid job uh, and they they were really necessary. Uh, the absence of the American forces created, uh, you know, uh, uh, led to the vacuum. And then you also had the, the stupidity of Maliki. Uh, I mean, who filled the vacuum? Put it this way. It was Iran. That, that's, that's what has led to the disaster of, of, of last year, namely of ISIS taking over. It was Iran. Who is running the show in Syria right now? Who has is, who is filled the vacuum in Syria? It is Iran. So, you know, we have to look at, you know, name things by their proper names, and except there's a vacuum yeah, it's except, filled Roy, by, them, by you, people who have no, no interest in a, in a stable, uh, moderate state. Uh, and, uh, and you have to decide, if you're the president of the United States, whether you uh, want to accept that. And if you don't, you have to then define a goal and a way of getting to the goal. And so all of, all of the history that you correctly cited uh, is relevant, but... <laughs> It doesn't tell you what to do next. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so let me ask you this, and I'll let you go. I'm sorry I'm already keeping you over time, but since it was America's policy to choose Iran's favorite groups, the Dawa Party and the Supreme Islamic Council, to fight for from 2003 through 11, uh, first Jafari, uh, who's now the foreign minister, uh, first Jafari, then uh, Maliki, and now Abadi, all three of them from the Dawa Party, uh, and, and since we knew all along that it was the Iranians' interest to split Iraq up, that they just wanted a strong, quote, federal system, like Sadr was always denouncing them for, um, uh, and that they didn't want to try to rule Sunni Stan. They didn't want to try to rule Anbar and Mosul and, and uh, uh, you know, Fallujah and Bakuba because that was basically foreign territory. They just wanted to run off with Shia Stan, and that was the policy that America supported in supporting their guys. And so now we're still, now that the Islamic State has risen up, now we have America fighting as the air cover uh, in one specific case, actually, that town of Amirli, where you had Quds Force fighting on the ground and American air cover, and, which is a great metaphor for the entire war that's now going on, uh, uh, still, for the last 12 years running now, America fighting for Iran and Iraq. Well, at the same time, as you were implying there, America is against Assad, who is working for Iran and on the Shiite side of this civil war in Syria. So, you know, if ISIS is really the enemy and we have to do something, wouldn't it make more sense for America to be consistent with George Bush and Barack Obama's Iraq policy and go ahead and back the Shiite government in alliance with Iran in Syria against the Islamic State and the al-Nusra Front? the Islamic State, which is the new holy terror, and the Nusra Front, which is sworn loyal to Zawahiri, the butcher of New York City. And what has Assad ever done uh, to America other than torture these guys for George W. Bush when he asked him to, even if they were innocent men? Well, uh, you know, to give you a one-word answer to a very complex question, the answer is no, hell no. Listen, uh, you, you have to remember the Syrian 
uprising was a national uprising. It was it came from the ground up. It was not led from outside. It was an, att- an attempt to bring a you know people wanted they, 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 the slogan was we want our dignity. We want our new. We want our own government. We want elections. Now, of course, the, a lot of water has uh, flowed down the Orontes River since then, but the fact is uh, that was the goal, and you cannot uh, go, if, if you're wise at least, uh, your, your policy should never be to fight the people when they are in a national uprising for a more modern state. I mean, that's a crazy thing to do, and Assad has demonized that group, and he did everything he could, in fact, to encourage uh, and to allow the uh, Islamic uh, extremists to come in. You know, all of last year, when uh, the uh, Islamic uh, State, uh, then they call themselves uh, the Islamic State of uh, Iraq and uh, and Syria, uh, was running a, a little state within a state in in the town of Raqqa, uh, Assad never bombed them. He never did anything to them. He was quite happy to have them there, it seems, at least uh, judging from... And said he was out there bombing civilians. And you have to understand that, Scott, that civilians have been decimated by this, uh, by this regime. That he, has dec- he has destroyed half of Aleppo. He has, a, he has destroyed city after city and village after village. And I've talked, I talked yesterday to some children who had been victims of – this is the, I was in the town of Kilis near the border with Syria. And they had been victims of barrel bombs. You know, he's dropping these indiscriminate weapons on civilians and and, and killing uh, children and, and parents, and there's no military purpose for it, no military objective uh, no, to, to be hit there. You have to understand this is the guy, this is the guy who says he's against terrorism, but as a matter of fact, there's a hell of a lot to, to let, it, let it grow in his country, and maybe even encouraged it. In fact, I have a series of articles that I hope come out soon that will, will give that history. So I don't think that that's a pseudo... I mean, you know, I'm not in power. I, I'm just a journalist. But uh, looking at it from the outside, I think that is not hard. That is hardly a suitable ally. Yeah. Well, uh, of course, uh, I'm for complete non-intervention here. It just uh, seems kind of crazy that this whole time we've been supporting a revolution, uh, which includes uh, friends of Osama. You know, I have the clip here. I won't bore you with it. I'm sure you've probably seen it. It's uh, Hillary Clinton, and it is, in a sense, a figure of speech. I'll concede that. But it's Hillary in March of 2012. And the question is being put to her by CBS News. Why aren't we doing more to help the rebels there? And she, in explaining, you know, the obviously she wanted to do more, as we already discussed. But Obama's reluctance, and she's towing his line because he's the president. And so defending the policy of not doing more, but doing some, she says, listen, Ayman al-Zawahiri has endorsed this revolution. Are we supporting al-Qaeda in Syria? We have to be very careful about this. And uh, when we look at opposition figures that we can really rely on, uh, it's we don't really see that. And, in fact, she tried in 2012 two different times to put together coalition governments that all both turned around immediately and endorsed the al-Nusra front, in their, as covered in McClatchy newspapers. In their desperate bids at street credibility, they had to endorse al-Qaeda in Syria to even try to be, to even try to pretend to be the new government there. And so... Uh, no, I'm not saying we should support the Baathists there, but it sounds like what you're saying is we should basically do what everyone agrees is the worst mistake of the Iraq war other than starting it, which was de the government and abolishing the Iraqi army. You're saying that that's what we should do in Syria, de the government, get rid of its evil totalitarian army, no disputing, just like Saddam Hussein's government, no disputing it's a fascist military dictatorship that murders innocent people. No one ever argued otherwise. Um, but you're saying that we should de the government and abolish the army when not leading up to and oops causes a bin Ladenite jihad, but in the middle of one. And that, to me, sounds well, a little bit insane, uh, right? No. I hope I hope I hope I'm I'm not uh, being taken as advocating one course or another because it's not my job to advocate a course of action. But I can uh, I can tell you <laughs> I can tell you courses of action that are going to lead to disaster, and uh, and one of them is um, uh, making an alliance with Assad. And the reason it would lead to an, to a disaster, I, I'm not saying there are good choices here. And and in life there are often 
you know, bad choices, worse choices, and still worse choices. Yeah. And, and I agree with you, by the way, on this. Worst. You know, you've got to pick the least worst uh, because that's a, you have to be pragmatic. Oh, I don't agree uh, with that. Point, well, I'm. I, I but I do. I'm, I'm sorry. I just meant to be clear. I just I, wanted to be clear that I agree with your part about we should not ally with Assad. I think that's just as bad as allying with Iran and the Bada Brigade in Iraq, which is horrible. I'm totally against it. Well, I'm against intervening so the, on any side of this. Well, I, on the other hand, uh, if you look at the world and you see an immense vacuum and you see that terrorists are, are filling that vacuum, you know they're going to come after you at some point. So whether you want to intervene or not, there's really not a lot of choices there. Because letting that we've, we've seen this in Afghanistan in the 1990s. Do you really want to have a repeat of, of, of 9-11, which is what that led to? Well, but it wasn't non-intervention that caused 9-11. It was support for Israel and the occupation of the Saudi Arabian desert to wage the blockade and the no-fly zone bombings over Iraq that whole time. You've read the fatwa, you know. Well, listen, I've, 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 I've written a book about Afghanistan in the 1990s, and the basic fact is that, uh, the, uh, that bin Laden created a state within a state. And, in fact, some, uh, my, case, my argument is that he hijacked the state in so doing. And the U.S. response was to throw some cruise missiles at him. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the lesson of Afghanistan, the major lesson should be that you cannot allow uh, this kind of an enormous security vacuum to develop, as it did in Afghanistan, and to have it filled by a state within a, a terrorist state within a state. That's what's happened right now. It's, it's what happened in Afghanistan in the 1990s is what's happening now in Syria and what's happened, just happened uh, as well as in, in Iraq. And it seems to me that whether we like whatever course of action we want to take or would prefer to take if we had our choice, and, and non-intervention is obviously a preferred way than, than intervention. But the fact is we should have learned our lesson from Afghanistan, and I don't think we have. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, this has been a very interesting discussion, and even though we disagree on uh, some of this stuff, I really like you, Roy, and I think you do good reporting, and I really appreciate your time on the show. Well, Scott, I must say, you are so well-informed. It's been delightful to, to chat with you and to have a discussion with you. So anytime. Okay, well, appreciate it. Talk to you again. Okay, take care, Mike. All right, so that's Roy Gutman. He's at McClatchyDC.com reporting uh, right now out of Turkey. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com. Hey, all Scott here. If you like me, you need coffee. Lots of it. And you probably prefer it tastes good, too. Well, let me tell you about Darren's Coffee Company at DarrensCoffee.com. Darren Marion is a natural entrepreneur who decided to leave his corporate job and strike out on his own, making great coffee. And Darren's Coffee is now delivering right to your door. Darren gets his beans direct from farmers around the world. All specialty, premium grade, with no filler. Hey, the man just wants everyone to have a chance to taste this great coffee. DarrensCoffee.com. Use promo code Scott and you get free shipping. DarrensCoffee.com.